Welcome to Psyched for Psychology, a Nystrom and Associates podcast. Our hosts, Michelle Iverson and Brett Cushing, are both licensed marriage and family therapists at Nystrom and Associates. Each week, they talk about all things mental health and therapy, and you get a chance to dive into specific psychology topics that help promote personal development and wellness. And now, here are your hosts, Michelle and Brett. Thanks so much for joining us today. We have a very special guest um, who's here with us. Uh, Today we have Wade Crandall. He is our Nystrom Clinical Director out of our Hugo office, and he is going to talk to us about the condition of hoarding. So he has actually helped people who hoard, um, who experience hoarding in all sorts of different capacities for about the past 13 years. Um, he's been a part of our ARMS team. He's done mental health coaching, case management, um, and he's been a mental health therapist working with this condition as well, too. Um, and importantly, too, he's served as the vice president of the Minnesota Hoarding Task Force um, from 2018 to 2022. And currently, he is their mental health resource consultant. Wait, it's great to have you here with us. I mean, we have an expert on hoarding. I I didn't even realize how extensive your experience is with this. So we're delighted to have you here because many of the things we do on our podcast is we dispel a lot of the myths and the overgeneralizations that can be really harmful for people as it relates to mental health diagnoses. So Hoarding is another one as well, where people, you know, somebody gathers a little too much or more than somebody else is comfortable with. Oh, that person's a hoarder. And so Mm -hmm. uh, yet this we kind of are flippant with it. And yet this is a serious condition. And we're so glad you can help us understand this. And as always, we're trying to, with that understanding, develop some compassion. Yeah. And do you want to tell us a little bit, too, on like why? I mean, there's even that TV show out there called Hoarders. There's a specific reason why we don't want to use that term. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Yeah. You know, we we just want to kind of use person first language, you know, because mm-hmm. people that hoard, they find the term hoarder to be offensive. You yes. know, I think it's true with any mental health condition is that just to kind of use person first Right. Where it's and if somebody has never heard that term person first language before, it's about that idea of you are a person first before a condition, before a diagnosis, before anything that you struggle with. And I think that's something that we kind of lose that feeling of humanity um, when we refer to somebody as hoarder, which is something we're not going to do on the podcast today. So I I thank you for letting us know about that and talking through that a little bit more. I love the way you put that, Wade, as well. Yeah, Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Can you mention for us uh, at the outset here what some of the typical characteristics are of people who hoard and and how is hoarding uh, disorder assessed? Yeah, great question. So the big two things for somebody that has a hoarding condition, really number one is an emotional attachment to the items and also having a hard time emotionally letting go of the item. So it's not just that, oh, somebody has a messy house. You got to have the emotional attachment with it. So, I mean, we go through an array of questions. Um, When we can't directly see into the home, either via a home visit or like via telehealth video chat, we have this uh, clutter image rating scale. It's basically a series of nine pictures that we would show the client in the office of like just kind of a random room. So like one series of pictures is a living room, one series of pictures is a kitchen, etc. So basically picture one is the least cluttered, mm-hmm. picture nine is the most cluttered. So we just ask them, you know, please tell me how, which picture most resembles the condition of your home right now. And that helps us to assess how severe it is. And then in conjunction with that, we got kind of this thing called the five levels of hoarding. And that was developed by the Institute for Challenging Disorganization. So level one is like what most Americans are. They got some clutter here and there. Level two is more mild to moderate hoarding. Level three is solidly moderate. This is where the person most likely is going to meet a condition of hoarding. Um, clinically speaking, and then levels four and five are the most severe. So this is where there's a bunch of piles like stacked up really high. Mm. Um, Many times they're going to have a hard time getting in and out out of their home via the entrances. 
And then you'll sometimes have what we call biohazards at level four and five. So like, you know, rotting food, you might have mice running around because there's so much stuff like that in the house. Is there specific items that you tend to see that people might experience hoarding with a a little bit more than others? Yeah, a lot of times you'll see papers, um, people that hoard papers, you know, they're kind of worried that they're going to miss like an important document or they have like a trauma or they might have like missed out on some money or something because they missed the papers. Um, a lot of times you'll get a lot of like nostalgia type items that are stacked around. Many times the people will hoard things that are related to like an unrecognized loss, like a loss that society doesn't acknowledge, like loss of job or loss of status. So their items are basically a way for them to kind of like, you know, feel a sense of identity and belonging. Other things that you'll see hoarded is, um, you know, like food, you know, I have to use things to the utmost capacity. Sometimes somebody will keep an apple that's half rotten, but then say that the other half is fine. Mm -hmm. Other things that people hoard, well, sometimes people hoard animals. You know, I don't have experience treating that directly, but that is something that is out there. That one can be very dangerous in terms of the client's safety, because if you can just imagine a scenario like that, um, that could really affect their health and well-being. So papers, you know, nostalgia items, that's a lot of what I see in practice. Wait, I want to come back to what you said earlier, too, about people having an emotional attachment. Mm -hmm. I think people who are listening might struggle with that. Understandably, how does somebody have an emotional attachment to papers and things that you just mentioned? Yeah, well, I mean, there can be like, you know, papers that are related to articles, you know, they might hoard information. So they want to make sure they're not losing information. So like, newspapers, newspapers, or like, you know, photos, or, you know, or people that do projects, that's a big one, you know, they'll have all these art related things, like, you know, all these materials, and they're gonna hold on to it for someday for them to use it, you know, and they can't emotionally imagine themselves letting go of some of those things. Well, that makes sense when we think about it a little bit more. Um, and you're connecting the dots, I think, for us. Maybe connect the dots a little bit on what what got you into this or what you know got you interested in this particular area. Yeah, great question. So back in 2009, I was in a practicum. Uh, with a gentleman out in the west suburbs, uh, Vern Devine, Dr. Vern Devine, and he did a lot of exposure therapy uh, with his practicum students. So we would go out into the community, we'd be the people in the person's car while they were behind the wheel having a panic attack, or, um, you know, we would do a lot of exposure therapy with anxiety. And the other thing that he did was hoarding. So um he would be the primary therapist you know in the office doing the talk therapy and then me as the practicum students would be out in the person's home doing the the hands-on work the actual exposure therapy related to that um so that's how i got interested in it you know and then at the last you know a couple agencies ago i was in arms over there and then it just kind of built from there i got to see like an actual abatement as a case manager where a person was ordered by law from the county to get their stuff out or they're going to lose their home. So I got to be part of that prog- uh, process and just doing a lot of in-home therapy at the last agency I was at. And that's basically where this, uh, you know, interest came from. I'm just really curious. I, I hear that you had exposure to this and I could see somebody who has exposure to this uh, could have the opposite effect where they're saying, oh, I want nothing to do with this, but there was something within you that was drawn to it. What, what was that? Help, help us understand. Well, you know, I think it's like, I think it's an interesting thing. I mean, the thing about like when you're helping people with hoarding conditions is that there's more of a tangible thing you see with like progress than you do with other conditions, other conditions, you still see progress and there's a lot of reward with that as a therapist. So with, Hoarding conditions, you know, I don't know, it just it just was something that was kind of exciting and 
and I, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I just mean that in like an like you know like a enthusiastic way. Like I wanted to help these people, you know, and and just seeing the progress and being there with them in the moment. No, that makes a lot of sense. I know you've made a good point. In our field, Wade, we don't see a lot of tangible results that are, are real observable. And like for me, the highlight of my week is when I mow my lawn because I say, <laughs> hey, look, I actually I can see something, right? And yeah. what I hear you saying is when working with hoarders, you could see more tangible progress and that motivated you. Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was a very interesting thing, you know, to just I work on it. I think, I don't know. It, sometimes you can't always explain it either. You just try things and you like it and you just kind mm -hmm. of roll with it, you know? Sure. And as therapists, sometimes we specialize in a certain area and, you know, we, we are treating that particular condition and then we see other conditions happening at the same time. We call that co-occurring conditions. Mm -hmm. What have you seen happen? What has been the most common co-occurring conditions that you've seen that go along with hoarding for a lot of these clients? Yeah. And here's the thing too, is that it's pretty rare that somebody just has a hoarding condition by themselves. So usually the primary ones are going to be depression. That's going to be a, a typical one with it. And the depression, as you can imagine, ag exacerbates the problem and that, you know, they're depressed. So they're going to do even less because of that. You get a lot of anxiety with people that have hoarding conditions. OCD can be up there as well. And with OCD, this is an interesting one in, in that you'll get what we call the, you know, dare I use a label, but kind of like what I would call the perfectionist recycler, you know, the, somebody that needs to recycle things in a perfectionistic way. So those are the people that just keep everything because they're so worried about like everything being perfectly recycled. Like, for example, I had a person back in the day where she was like, well, this paper is white and this paper is blue. Like, where do I go? And, and she wanted to like, you know, get the perfect vacuum, you know, before she did anything. And she wanted to go visit the recycling center, you know. So that's a perfect example of how OCD can really, really increase the hoarding behavior. So those are the top ones. And then also, in addition, is post-traumatic stress disorder. We can see a lot of that. There can be a lot of like trauma associated with hoarding. And then though it's not a really a diagnosis, but a lot of grief and loss of people and of those unrecognized losses that I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we recently did a podcast on some of the most misunderstood diagnoses and we didn't include hoarding only because we knew we were going to interview Wade on this. Yeah, but... we had you waiting in the wings here, Wade, yeah. <laughs> but I, I would include this as one of those that are some of the most misunderstood. Well, well you... yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. What are some of the misconceptions that people have? Because mm -hmm. like Michelle's saying, this really falls in that category. I'm glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. Like, what are, they, you know, people have these images, they have these ideas, and what are these misconceptions? Well, I think one of the main misconceptions is that they can just clean it up like, you know, they're lazy, just clean it up kind of thing. I mean, if they could clean it up, they would. They, they have work that they got to do to get to that point. You know, they got a lot of desensitization they got to go through, a lot of therapy type stuff, emotional reflection. So it's not just that they can just clean it up if they, again, if they would, they could. I think another misconception in our industry, I would say, and I, uh, just as a whole, is that, oh, all these hoarding cases are going to just be horrendous. You know, like you you mentioned the show Hoarders, right? Like, And I think we as an industry have a problem where we don't have enough therapists treating hoarding. You know, you don't have to go in the home if you don't want to. I mean, you can do it out of the office. Um, so I, I would challenge therapists. I mean, not every case is going to be like that TV show. I mean, a lot of cases that I've treated actually have been level two and three, and those that's the best place to intervene anyways. Mm -hmm. Once you get to level five, it's not that you can't make progress. I, I want to make that clear, but that's usually kind of emergency situations, right? Then we're, then we're kind of doing like the damage control after like a forced clean out, which can be very traumatic. So those would be the top two misconceptions, one from society and one from just therapists in our industry, I would say. Not intentionally, but just I think they get scared of it, you know. 
Um, and then I think sometimes a misconception of the clients themselves is that they can't get better. And that's not true either. They can get better. What do you think it kind of affects, like, what are the effects on both the people who experience this condition and society when this is occurring? Yeah, I mean, the people themselves, I mean, a big one is just the social isolation. Mm -hmm. So just the diminished social contact, the isolation. We see how that's affected people just through the pandemic, especially the early phases of it. Um, also, strain relationships with family on top of that, the, the social dynamics related to that with this, the family strained. Um, a lot of times families don't want to deal with this. Um, also, you know, we have cost to society related to like, you know, when, cl when clients like are not able to take care of their homes adequately, particularly when they're renting. Um, landlords incur a lot of costs, you know, because of this eviction costs, cleanup costs. And then we have more people that potentially are really homeless, you know, because of this, because they get evicted due to, you know, that their place gets to, into such a place where it becomes a danger to the people living around them. Wade, you'd mentioned desensitization as an important aspect of working with people who are hoarding. Can you uh, expand on that? What, what do you mean by that? What's that involve? Yeah, I mean, I think more simply put, it's really facing your fears. So there's really kind of this inherent, like, aversion when you have hoarding to not want to get rid of the stuff because it's uncomfortable. It's, you know, it, it causes fear, it causes anxiety. So you just keep holding on to it. So in, in therapy for hoarding, what we do is we do a lot of like gradual desensitization. So like we might start off and say, Hey, why don't you just like recycle this one bottle, this one glass bottle? And then what we're going to do is we're going to then have you kind of ride through that wave of anxiety, kind of feel it peak while you're not taking it back. And then eventually it'll go down. So then the more they do that, then the more the, the waves of the anxiety related to it, it won't be so high. Then over time, it'll get easier and easier, but they got to do it over and over again. So that's all. It's a lot of work, you know, it takes a lot of consistency. And then another thing that we do too, is we expose them to not doing things. So like, don't bring in stuff from the uh, thrift store, you know, at the more advanced stages of therapy, what we also do is, you know, we'll ask them to go to like a thrift store and then walk in there and don't buy anything and come out. Mm -hmm. But that's more at the advanced stages when they're doing really well. And then mixed in with that desensitization, facing fears work is many times there'll be trauma and or grief and loss. So we'll be kind of doing that in conjunction with all of this. Great. How long would you say that type of treatment tends to take? You know, it can be a bit longer. I mean, if we were to compare like your average outpatient client for therapy, I would say, you know, on the low end, we're talking eight to 12 sessions and then with you know, complex traumas a year or more. Now with people that have a hoarding condition, in my experience, it's anywhere on average from six months to three years. Some therapists that do this have documented longer. There's always going to be outliers, but in my, at least my real life experience, it has been anywhere from six months to three years, depending on the severity and what's going on. And then you mentioned too that we can do in home we can do in home treatments for this. We can do in office treatments. And now we've got telehealth as being an yeah. option for therapy as well too. How would you kind of compare each of those and how does that tend to work in this type of treatment? Well, I've done all three of them. So the in home one is going to be the most like accurate in terms of assessment mm -hmm. and and viewing the progress. Some of the downfalls of that, though, is that it can be very distracting as well, where like the client isn't as, you know, like it's it, it can be distracting for the clinician on some level and the client because there's a lot of chaos around. So when you start talking about all the deeper issues, sometimes that can be a hindrance. Um, in office is good because, you know, you're not, you don't have the distractions, so you can really kind of focus on the underlying core issues. But again, then the assessment isn't as good. And then with telehealth, you know, it's great because like now we can reach people all over the state of Minnesota now. So it, 
the telehealth thing really just kind of adds a dynamic that we're be, we're able to reach more people than we used mm-hmm. to be. But what I would say is if it's all at all possible, you know, is to have like a combination of the both of them where you're not just in the home, but you're not just in the office. Now for me, I don't do in home work anymore. So for me, it's like, why don't we have some telehealth and then some in the office to kind of mix it up? So those are kind of the primary differences between the two, the three modes of therapy. Wade, when you encounter people who have these misconceptions, uh, people say things that are just uninformed, ignorant, and I'm sure it's frustrating when you hear that. If you could say anything to people who just don't understand and ridicule this uh, or just kind of dismiss it uh, and say, well, they just need to kind of clean up. If you could say anything to people that are struggling to understand this, what would you say? Well, you know, kind of what I said before, it's, you know, if they would, they could, you know. Um, But to kind of elaborate further, I would just say, I mean, it's just like any other mental health condition, you know, I mean, on some level, I mean, it's a condition of the brain, right? The brain is an organ, just like the heart is an organ. So, you know, it's kind of about just educating people that, you know, depression is a condition of the brain, anxiety is a condition of the brain, which is an organ, and so is hoarding. And I think, too, I mean, like, I understand why people get frustrated. I don't get too agitated about it, actually, when people are frustrated. I think part of education is not scolding people, but to kind of empathize, like, yeah, that's that sounds like that's frustrating for you to see that, you know, particularly family members, right? So trying to empathize with their frustration and then educating, you know, like, I, you know, I think... I think when we, when we as professionals scold people that don't understand, that can have the opposite effect as well. I really like what you're saying, man. Pivoting the focus off of someone who might be struggling with hoarding and putting the focus on the person who might be critical of it and just invite that person to explore. I wonder why that is hard for you to understand. And, and yeah. I really like how you're pivoting away from uh, one and putting the focus on the other. That, I think that's very shrewd. Thank you. And I'm kind of curious too, did you, um, you had mentioned with landlords and housing, is there a way that landlords can help? Landlords get a pretty big bad rap when it comes to like dealing with clients that have hoarding issues, you know, like I have more of a nuanced view of landlords. I mean, first of all, I mean, you know, they are providing people housing, you know, that's how I look at it. Now, that being said, we know some landlords might be not as good as others, but I would say like if a landlord can give you maybe, you know, an extra chance or two, that would be greatly appreciated, you know, if if that's at all possible, kind of more of a results based approach versus kind of like a heavy handed, like, you know, you got to get this all done or else type thing. Mm -hmm. I know like um, Joe Jurisic, he's not a landlord, but he's... um, He's like a health inspector through Hennepin County. Um, He's in our Minnesota hoarding task force, and he tries to take more of a gradual approach with people instead of saying like, hey, I need you, I'm going to like, you know, condemn your house. You know, he tries to work with them. Mm -hmm. So if a landlord, if at all possible, is able to, you know, work with the client and give them maybe a couple extra chances, that can go a long way. Now, that being said, you know, the landlord also has to be aware of the safety of his tenants, right? So, like, if somebody has all these papers all over the place and they're a smoker, right? I mean, that could be a tinderbox. So, one thing we have to understand is that safety comes first as well. As much of empathy as we have for people at Horde, we also have to be realistic at the same same time. And one thing I say to clients that are frustrated with their landlords is obviously I empathize with them. They're dealing with this serious condition is just to do some radical acceptance with them. Like, yeah, you know, your, your therapy, your landlord is not your therapist, unfortunately, you know, and I try to get them to radically accept that because sometimes what happens is clients will perseverate on how misunderstanding their landlord is. But I also would recommend, you know, like if the person has like a social worker in their life to maybe if the social worker can advocate to the landlord, the case manager, so kind of using their network to try to work with the landlord, I think, is the most effective route at, at all possible. And again, 
every landlord's going to be a little bit different. That's why it's more of a case by case basis. Wait, is, I'm just curious as we're going to be wrapping up here, what, what's the most rewarding aspect for you and working with people who are hoarders? What's uh, most rewarding about this for you? Yeah, I mean, the most rewarding thing for me in working with people that hoard is just, again, just seeing the progress that they're making, seeing a person that's able to, like, you know, prevent themselves from getting evicted, preventing themselves from, you know, losing their home, you know, seeing them open their their lives up again because their mm. house is open, you know, clearing that mental space because that the environment can really you know, cloud up their head as well. You know, you have all these items and it's really kind of like a process of where they're kind of liberating themselves. And that's really overall the most rewarding part of working with people that have a hoarding condition. If anybody had any questions about this, whether they were concerned if they might be experiencing this, a family member or friend, where could they go to get more information? Yeah, I think a great local resource is through the Minnesota Hoarding Task Force. So the the website is M as in Michael, N as in Nancy. M, I'm just going to say it out loud instead of doing the acronyms. MNHTF.org. Again, MNHTF.org. And you can just Google Minnesota Hoarding Task Force and the website will pop right up. There's a lot of informational stuff out there, informational videos, resources that families can go to. So that would be the kind of the, the place that I would go for people to get some more information. Hmm. Absolutely. And we will go ahead and we put that um, website into our link in the episode description. So you can check that out. Um, you can always check us out at nystromcounseling.com. And we will put in a link for Wade's recent interview that he did about this topic with WCCO. All right. Wade, thanks so much for joining us. And all you who are listening, we're so glad you tuned in. Please be sure to like, share, subscribe to our podcast. And we look forward to helping you understand more about psychology, developing compassion, and finding healing for yourself. Thank you as always for listening, and please be sure to leave us a review. While this podcast can't be a replacement for therapy, we hope you enjoyed our discussion today and join us again next time. Nice German Associates is always available to those who are struggling. If you find yourself in need of support and help, please check us out at nystromcounseling.com. Nice